all believers, all Christians are called to live the life of faith. For some believers, the life of faith will be rather brief. For others, it will be a very long life. We see this, first of all, in the life of Abel. This man, we are told in Hebrews 11 and verse 4, lived the life of faith. But just like his name, the life of Abel was brief. But even though it was brief, it was still a life of faith. He received the revelation of God and he responded to that revelation in obedience. But the life of faith for some believers will be long and that is seen especially in the life of Abraham. Abraham is a man that lived for 175 years and this life of Abraham was a life of faith. Now, whether the life of faith is going to be brief or long, what is true for all believers is that this life of faith is going to have times of hardship, times of trouble, times of difficulty. And what we are called to do in the midst of those difficult times is to live the life of faith. Now, I do want to remind you of the three components of the life of faith. We saw this a little while ago when we introduced Hebrews chapter 11. But let me remind you that faith consists of three parts. It involves our head, our heart, and our hands. With our head, we A, acknowledge what God has said. In order to live the life of faith, we need to have knowledge from God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the first component of faith is with our heads, we acknowledge what God has said. Then with our hearts, we B, believe what God has said and C, with our hands, commit to what God has said. Faith is as easy as A, B, C, acknowledging, believing, and committing. And it involves our entire being, our head, our hearts, and our hands. And we see this in the illustration of the life of Abraham. Now, I want you to notice as you glance at Hebrews chapter 11 for a moment, you have seen a few individuals that we have already studied. We've looked at the life of Abel. We looked at the life of Enoch. And we even saw the life of Noah. Now we come to Abraham. And if you have a look at the text, you will see that the life of Abraham actually goes from verse 8 all the way through to verse 19. In comparison to the other individuals who live the life of faith, Abraham has the most attention. But there really is no surprise because Abraham is seen as the father of our faith. We will learn a little bit more about his life in just a moment. But Abraham is one of the most significant, if not the most significant, Old Testament character. And we're going to see a little bit of that in just a moment. Now, when it comes to the life of Abraham, we have a record of it here in Hebrews 11. But the historical narrative where we learn all about Abraham and his life is found in the book of Genesis. And interestingly, his life spans from Genesis chapter 11 all the way through to Genesis 25. That large chunk in the book of Genesis is dedicated to the life of this man by the name of Abraham. Now, a few words concerning Abraham. Abraham grew up in a pagan family, a family that did not know the one true God a family that worshipped the gods of this world. This man was called by God's choosing to be a man who would go to a place that was yet disclosed to him far away from his home. And there the Lord would begin to unfold a great plan through his life. In fact, the results of the promises made to Abraham are actually going to ultimately be fulfilled by reversing the horrible effects of the curse as recorded in Genesis 3. 
And there is going to be great blessing that is going to come as a result of the promises made to Abraham. Abraham truly was a great individual. But as you read the historical narrative beginning in Genesis 11 through to 25, it's not very long before you realize that Abraham was a man who failed. He was disobedient to the Lord on a number of occasions. He did things that were unacceptable. He was not a man of perfection. Yet he is recorded here in Hebrews chapter 11 as a man of faith. And great attention is placed on the life of Abraham. And there is a very important foundational lesson for us to remember. The life of faith is not defined by constant perfection, but the life of faith is defined and characterized by consistent perseverance. And that is what we see in the life of Abraham. Now, what I want you to note before we dive right into this passage is in Hebrews 11 verses 8 through to 19, we have three characteristics of Abraham's faith. What are these characteristics? I want you to see, first of all, in verse 8, that Abraham had a willing faith. Secondly, in verses 9 through to verse 16, Abraham had a waiting faith. And finally, in verses 17 to 19, Abraham had a watching faith. So even though there were times of failure, there were many mistakes, along the pathway that he walked, there were times of compromise. There was much difficulty, there were trials and there were hardships. But what marked that life was a willingness, a willingness to wait, and in waiting, he was also watching. So let's begin with our very first point found in this passage, and it's there in verse 8, and that is Abraham had a willing faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. This takes us back to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, the Lord gives instructions to Abraham. Abraham was living in a place called Haran. And there, as he was living in this particular place, he received revelation from God. That revelation became the foundation of his life of faith. As we've said multiple times throughout this series in Hebrews 11, there cannot be a life of faith without revelation. If you do not have the word of God, you cannot have faith. Well, the word of God came to Abraham in a very unique way, different to how we receive it. We have it here in the scriptures. But the word of God comes to Abraham by means of an instruction. Consider the words in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That is an incredible promise. From Abraham's perspective, out of nowhere, the instruction from the high king of heaven comes. The Lord God has spoken. And as God issues this promise to Abraham, I want you to note that it consists of three parts. It is a promise that includes land, descendants, and blessing. Interestingly enough, this is a reverse of the curse found in Genesis chapter 3. 
In Genesis chapter 3, there is going to be a dynamic in which there isn't blessing. There's going to be conflict and disharmony between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. There's going to be difficulties with regards to childbearing. And also there is going to be hardship with regards to land. Notice here a complete reversal of that. The Lord says you're going to be blessed. He says you're going to have many descendants. And he says that you are going to inherit the land. This is actually God's solution to the biggest problem in this world, and that is sin. Because sin came into this world, this world has problems. You and I have problems in our life, difficulties in our life, because of sin. The effects of sin, the effects of the fall, bring hardship into our lives. There are things like disasters in this world, even diseases. Right now, we are experiencing the effects of the coronavirus. All these things ought not to surprise us. They are here because we are living in a fallen world. And God appears to Abraham and makes a promise and says, through you, I am going to undo the curse. A complete reversal. So this promise, in God's perfect timing, was truly amazing. But imagine how difficult this would be for Abraham. God has appeared to him. He has given him very specific instructions that you are to go, but they're not so specific that he tells him where to exactly. He just simply tells him that he is to leave and this is what he is going to receive. Abraham is going to have to say goodbye to family. He will have to say goodbye to friends. He will have to say goodbye to neighbours and even to all that is familiar to him. And you think about it. When Abraham begins to share the news with people and they ask him, Abraham, where are you going? All he can answer is, I'm going to the place where God wants me to go, but I don't actually know where that is yet. What's going to happen, Abraham, when you get there? He says, I don't know the exact timing, but I'm going to have many descendants. Through me is going to come great blessing. These are the things that he would have to say to people. And I'm sure not everyone would have been persuaded that that was all true. Abraham was called by God to go, to go to the place of God's choosing. And through him, God is going to issue a great blessing. How did Abraham respond? When God made himself known to Abraham and gave him the clear instructions to go from your country, leave your family, and go to the land that I will show you, how did he respond to such a huge task? We're not to take this lightly. This was not easy for him. But the answer is found in the narrative of Genesis 12, but note exactly what Hebrews 11 and verse 8 says. We are told, by faith Abraham obeyed. Abraham obeyed the command of the Lord. Just there, in those first four words, by faith Abraham obeyed, we have the three elements of faith. Abraham received revelation from God. He believed it to be true and he responded to it in obedience. Let's just reduce it down to two words. Abraham obeyed. That there is the life of faith. Uh, we could finish our message at that point and say that is a summary of the life of Abraham. But you'll notice the text goes on. But the point that I want you to see here in verse 8 is first of all, Abraham had a willing faith. My dear friends, we are all called by God, as the people of God, to live a life of faith. That is what is pleasing to our Lord. 
That is what we are called to do. We are a people of faith. And the question I want you to ask yourself right now is this. What does God require of you? We ought to respond by saying, I am willing to do what the Lord would have me do. Now that's going to be different for us all in different situations. But I want you to see in this most extreme situation that when God had made his will known to Abraham, Abraham lived the life of faith because he had a willing faith. He was willing to go where God told him to go. Abraham's actions of packing up and leaving Haran and making his journey to Canaan revealed a willing faith. Now, sometimes the life of the believer is going to involve struggles. It is going to involve times of sacrifice. And if we are going to live the life of faith, there needs to be a heart that says, I am willing to do what God would have me do. Whether that be in your home, in your workplace, in your life as a believer in this world, whatever it is, are you willing to do what God would have you do, even if it means sacrifice and struggle? It's not an easy thing to say that. It's not an easy thing to do that. And that is why we need the gift of God in faith. Faith is the only way Abraham could do this. It was not a natural thing. It was not something he just simply said, I can rally up all my strength and all my capacities and all my abilities and do what God would have me do. No, the only way Abraham was willing to leave Haran and go to a location that God will show him far, far away, saying goodbye to all that was familiar, was if he had faith. And faith fueled the willingness of Abraham to go. So Abraham had a willing faith. The willing faith of Abraham was seen in his willingness to respond to what God had said. So we read in Hebrews 11 and verse 8 that Abraham obeyed and when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going. Notice those last words of verse 8. Abraham was not only willing, but he went. And in actually going, he didn't know where he was going. This is incredible. Because his confidence is in the Lord. The Lord doesn't always reveal to us the end. We don't always have all the details to what he calls for us to do in the life of faith. But what we must be committed to by his help and by his grace is this willingness that says, Lord, what you say, I will do. Where you send, I will go. This is what verse 8 communicates to us. But then we come to the second point, and you'll notice that it is far more lengthy in terms of attention given to it in the text, and that is verses 9 through to 16. And what we have in verses 9 through to 16 is what we call a waiting faith. Abraham was not only willing to do what God had told him to do, but Abraham was also willing to wait for God to fulfill what he said he would fulfill. In other words, Abraham's life of faith did not mean instant fulfillment. We live in a time where we know what it is to have things instantly fulfilled. Uh, we have the ability to get food at a fast food restaurant. We can now even order something on our phone and have it delivered to our front doorstep. We don't really like to wait in our culture. We love things to be quick and done super fast. But we need to remind ourselves that the life of faith is not to be viewed that way. We are not to allow the culture's thinking to invade our minds and inform and dictate to us how we should have the Christian life. I understand that there are a lot of 
books out there uh, in the name of Christianity that promote the idea of instant fulfillment, that God will give you your best life now, or that God wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be always healthy. There is this notion of having the future kingdom life here and now, kingdom living in the present. But that is not biblical, and that's certainly not seen in the life of Abraham. Abraham had a waiting faith, and he had to wait a long time. Now, what did he have to wait for? There are many things that Abraham had to wait for throughout the course of his life, but Hebrews 11, and particularly the Genesis narrative, emphasize two things that Abraham had to wait for. First of all, he had to wait for the land of promise. He had to wait a long time. And secondly, he had to wait for descendants. You remember the Lord promised him that when you go through you, I am going to give you many descendants. And not only is he going to have many descendants, I am also going to give you the land. Now, when Abraham responded to the call of God and left, this was not instantly fulfilled. Abraham, as he walked the life of faith, learnt that this life involved waiting. That is to say, he not only had to be willing to do what God had said, he also had to be willing to wait for what God had said. Let's first of all have a look at what we see here in verse 9, and that is Abraham's willingness to wait for the land. Verse 9, by faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Then jump down to what we read in verse 13 down to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God promised Abraham the land. But it's very interesting to note that Abraham never owned the land. As he moved from Haran, he made his way down to the land of promise, the land that God was going to give Abraham. And he went down to the south of that land and there he pitched his tent. There were times he had to move around throughout various locations and even go down to the south. He was living a life of a nomad. Abraham was moving around and around and around throughout his life. He eventually made it to the promised land, but he never actually inherited the land. In fact, the only part of the land that he personally owned was a plot where Sarah, his wife, would be buried and where he would later on be buried. He didn't see the fulfillment to the promise that God had made him. He had to wait his whole life and he never saw the fullness of this promise. But he was willing to wait. But notice the emphasis of what we read here in verses 9 and following. Even though he was in a foreign land and living in tents, and even his son Isaac and grandson Jacob were doing the same, we read in verse 10, he was waiting for something bigger. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And again in verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Abraham was waiting for the fulfillment of God, but Abraham was actually looking past this life. He was looking to a city in the future, a city whose foundation and maker is God. 
God is the designer of this city. Abraham was actually looking toward the city that we are promised in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and that is called the New Jerusalem. In that city, there will be no more sin, no more sadness, no more struggle, no more sorrow. All of it will be done away with. Why was Abraham prepared to live life in this passing world and deal with all the struggles that he faced, why was he willing to wait? Because he was waiting for his ultimate home, and that is the eternal city. We need to remember that. As we walk the pathway of faith, this very narrow, well-worn path of believers who've walked before us, There are even stains of blood like Abel, men who have died, women who have given up their lives for the sake of the Lord. A pathway with potholes, sometimes as big as craters. As we walk this narrow and difficult pathway, we are to keep our eyes on the prize. We are to keep our eyes on the city that is eternal, and that is the glory of heaven. Yes, we are to serve the Lord with all our might here. We are to be grateful for every good gift. But dear friends, know and understand, this world is not our home. We are just passing through. The heavenly country is where we will be forever. So therefore, we ought to wait on the Lord for that. And that waiting may take a long time. So in that waiting, we ought to hold the things of this world loosely. So what I want you to see in verses 9 through to 16 is the emphasis here on Abraham living a waiting faith. And in this waiting faith, he was waiting for the eternal city. But there was also something else he was waiting for. And it's what we see in verses 11 through to 12. He was willing to wait for descendants. God not only promised Abraham that he would have the land, but there would also be descendants. Have a look at what we read in verse 11 and 12. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants. And as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Abraham was willing to wait for his future descendants. Now, this time of waiting was very difficult for Abraham. He was 75 years old when God first appeared to him in Genesis 12. 75. And at that age, he and his wife, Sarah, were unable to have children. Clearly, there was a problem in her being able to conceive. Yet God has said to Abraham, you are going to have many descendants. So Abraham, even though he was in a difficult situation of being childless, was willing to go where God had said, and not only was he willing to go, he was willing to wait for God to fulfill this promise. He didn't know when it was going to happen. And we learn that the years begin to go by sometime after God first revealed himself to Abraham and issued this promise. He appeared to him again a second time and reiterated these promises. But then... At a particular moment in his life, Abraham, with a lapse of good judgment, had relations with Sarah's handmaid. And at the age of 86, Ishmael was born to this handmaid. This was disobedience to the Lord. It was not honorable. Even though Abraham now has a son, this is not the son of God's promise. He was told that Ishmael will not fulfill this promise. It will be fulfilled through the child that I have promised you. But then, 14 years later, at the age of 100, Sarah was 90. 
Sarah gave birth to the son of promise, and his name was Isaac. Now, when the Lord had first made this known, they laughed, laughed in a sense of distrust. But when they heard the cry of this little baby, as Sarah held this child of promise at the age of 90, the laugh of distrust became a light, a laughter of delight. They trusted the Lord. They had to wait 25 years for that promise to be fulfilled. 25 years is a long time to wait. God said to Abraham, I want you to go. I want you to leave your land and I want you to go to the place where I will show you and there you will have many descendants. Even though there was failure along the way, ultimately there was a sense of perseverance in which he did trust the Lord and the Lord had fulfilled his promise. And this was a miraculous work because we read in verse 11 that Sarah was past the age to conceive and in verse 12, Abraham was described as a man as good as dead. There was no procreating abilities within this couple, but God had done a work. He fulfilled his promise and he did it according to his perfect timing. So even though it wasn't marked by constant perfection, being marked by consistent perseverance, Abraham had a waiting faith. Overall, in the final analysis, he was prepared to wait upon God, and that waiting characterized his life of faith. We now come to the final point in this passage, and it is actually the most emotional. It's found in verses 17 through to 19, and that is this. Abraham had a watching faith. This is the final lesson we see in this passage. That is to say, Abraham actually expected God to do what he promised. And that's what the life of faith must do. This was demonstrated in a situation that would have been intensely difficult. It would have been heart-wrenching. It was by means of being willing to sacrifice his son, Isaac. This was the hardest test Abraham would ever have to face. We read in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2, The Lord God spoke to Abraham and said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. How difficult this would have been. But we are told that Abraham arose early and with his son embarked on this journey. A few days had passed. I don't know what the conversations were between Abraham and Isaac, but just think about the fact that Abraham had to wait 25 years for him to be born from the perspective of the promise of God. He was 100 when this child was born, and now he is told to take his son, his only son, and sacrifice him. He went on the journey. And the moment finally arrived as Isaac, this young man, walking with his father, carrying with him the elements ready for this sacrifice. No doubt Isaac had seen his father prepare for sacrifices before. He had seen a goat, a lamb taken and laid there on the altar and with a knife cut the animal and then make a burnt offering before the Lord. He had seen it. And Isaac even asked his dad the very natural question and that is, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said to his son, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Yireh, the Lord will will provide. 
But then Abraham has his son lay down on the altar. Now this is an incredible willingness of his only son to walk to the place of sacrifice and then willingly lay himself down in obedience to his father. And as Isaac is lying there on the altar, Abraham takes this sharpened knife and he places himself in the position in which he is ready to thrust it into the body of his son. And just then, in that moment, with the knife poised, ready to be plunged, the Lord God speaks. He cries out in Genesis 22, 11 and 12, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And straight after that moment, God reaffirms the promise that he had made that I am going to bless you, Abraham. There are going to be many descendants through you, Abraham. He reaffirms this covenant promise. Abraham had a watching faith. How was that a watching faith? Well, it's interesting that as we go back to Hebrews 11, I want you to read verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises that was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named... He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. What's going on there? Abraham knew that God had made a promise to him. And he's repeated this promise on multiple occasions. And it had been made very clear that this promise is going to be fulfilled through your son, Isaac. So Abraham concluded that even if I am to kill my son, God must raise him up from the dead because he said the blessing will come through Isaac. So as Abraham went through this excruciating experience, it was with a watching faith. He was watching to see God actually do what he said he would do. That can only come from a life of faith. Abraham had such confidence in God's promise to be fulfilled, that he was willing to watch and see God raise his own son up from the dead. Abraham himself has experienced a resurrection before in his own body. The text tells us that he was good as dead. He was unable to procreate, but the Lord had changed that. Interestingly enough, in Genesis chapter 25, after the death of his wife Sarah, Abraham marries a lady by the name of Keturah. And they end up having six more children. So there was life in Abraham. He had seen what God had done, and he knows that God is able to raise up his son, his only son, to fulfill his promise. This was difficult, but Abraham trusted the Lord. Sometimes things in life might not seem to work out the way we think it should. But the life of faith says, but I'm going to watch knowing that our God is good and that he will unfold his perfect will. Sometimes we're going to be called to do things that involve sacrifice and struggle, things that are very difficult for us. And even though it's going to be tough, it's going to be hard, even in these uncertain times that we're all living in right now. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone what's going to happen in the next few weeks or months. We need to remember that as God's people, no matter what times we live in, even in such uncertain and tough times, we are called to live a life of faith. And that life of faith is to have a heart that is willing to do what God says. It needs to be a life that is not only willing, but willing to wait on God and his perfect timing. The temptation for us 
will be to take things in our own hands. But we are to wait on the Lord. And in waiting, we are to watch. Watch God unfold his perfect promises to the glory of his name. I don't know what that looks like in my life and in your life, but I do know this, that the day will come when we will all be in that future city. And when we are there, there will be no more tears. There will be no more trouble. Trials and temptations will be gone. Sickness, sadness will be removed. Suffering will no longer be a part of our existence. Sin will once and for all be gone because we will be in the place where the fullness of the promise that God had made to Abraham will be seen and that will be eternal blessing with a host of descendants and those descendants that God promised Abraham when he said, look up the stars and count them. Look at the grains of sand and count them. Your descendants will be like that. As Abraham looked at the stars and looked at the grains of sand, you are in that number if you are a child of God. Our God is good and we are to trust him. And what we are called to do is live the life of faith. May God help us even in our failures to honour him that he may receive the glory.